Hello and welcome to another edition of the Irish Angle on Jump To It. Uh, this week, as usual, I'm joined by Emma Nagel and uh, Johnny Ward, and we're going to be discussing the rehoming of racehorses. Quite a big topic here about what happens with racehorses after they finish their career. And uh, we'll get stuck into it straight away. So welcome, Johnny, Emma. Uh, first of all, Emma, you've, you've talked to a lot of people around this area and um, what they thought about who's responsible for the care of racehorses after they finish their career. Is it the owner who should have the ultimate responsibility? I think the industry has to take a role here. And I also think breeders have a, have an, um, a part to play too. So what did most of the people say, Emma? Yeah, so kind of the overwhelming reaction to the question has been that owners need to take full responsibility for their horses throughout their racing career and beyond. Um, I think that's something that's maybe not clear to owners when they're entering into racing, which I suppose, you know, maybe it should be, I suppose if you buy a dog, you don't expect, to, you know, when the dog gets old, you just can't just throw it away. It's the same with a horse. Um, but the rehoming options has definitely become a, a easier option for um, a lot of owners. It's become a much more accessible. I was actually speaking to a girl who rehomes a few horses for the McNeil family. And I think the responsibility they take for their horses after racing is just it's just uh, kind of an inspiration for any owner. Like I know most owners might not have the same kind of means and connections and knowledge, but she actually told me a brilliant story about how she took a great horse from them and she was looking after him, all was going well. And the horse suffered a very bad bout of colic. And basically she said, if the McNeils didn't support me behind this, like she owned the horse fully at this stage, but she contacted the McNeils and said, what has happened to the horse? And if she didn't have their support, basically the horse would have to be put down because of the price of the operation. And so generously they paid for it and saved the horse's life in the end. And I thought that was just a brilliant story. Now I know not all owners will have the same kind of means to do something like that with a horse, but it kind of got me thinking maybe when someone's entering into ownership, like could something be done about, you know, maybe if there was a levy put on training fees or if a certain portion of a horse's earnings went towards a retired their retirement fund and then you know if they did suffer injuries like uh, this horse did later on in life that this money would be sitting there to be used and you know that that would be something you know you could track where the horse has gone the money would be used for the horse just later in life and they wouldn't be just left on their own like so many of them seem to be seem to have been in the last few years and um, that was just kind of one idea i had but yeah, no, the overwhelming response has been owners must take full full responsibility and people are calling for more traceability for the horses after their racing career has ended. You know, we can we can trace a calf a calf from when they're born to when they die, but for some reason race horses, once they retire from racing, they kind of seem to disappear into the abyss a lot of the time. Um, you know, so maybe something more a uh, kind of more developed code where everyone could maybe follow a horse where they've gone after their racing career should be put in place maybe yeah well this is the thing that the racing career is very short compared to their overall life expectancy the life expectancy of a thoroughbred is around 27 years they're they're out of training even the national hunt ones are out of training by the time they're 10 or 11 um so you're talking about more than half of their life is going to be spent in retirement so how do you look after that that's the question and we know the other side of this is we're producing a lot of racehorses that's the thing we're breeding over nine thousand racehorses a year in ireland uh folds being born and yet there's only about five thousand horses in training in an actual year so we're producing a lot more than actually go into training a lot of them are sold abroad but at the same time there must be some onus on the breeders here and we see with one of the organizations that looks after a new organization set up in 2020 called Troella which looks after the rehoming of racehorses and it uh, looks to be a very good setup that they're being funded by stud farms breeders and stallion owners which shows they they feel themselves that that sector of the of the industry that they have some role to play in this but i think the industry as a whole does too johnny what do you make of it the whole area of rehoming racehorses yeah, Vinny, it's a it's a fascinating area for me because uh, I've I've definitely first hand experience of this. Um, probably good and bad. Like you know, I suppose the wider thing is we. I, I've I've come to realize I'm forty this year that I I've basically been looking at the world wrong the whole way. I've I've just seen the world through the eyes of a human when we're just one of all these species in the world, 
and you know that we're, we're in difficult times at the moment and the animals are basically the ones that are doing no harm and we just look as at animals as ways to you know eat meat or, or you know something that's um, dispensable and with horses it, it can be like that like you can basically own a horse and nobody really accounts for the horse if you ended up just you know Take, taking the horse to the field and ended his life because he's no use to anymore. It's, it's kind of just goes into the abyss. And it's a very interesting philosophical point. Who's responsible for the horse? Now, when, when I get into horse ownership, um, it was never something that the trainer said to you, oh, by the way, we'll have to chat about it when the horse is no good anymore or whether you can't, when you can't pay the training fees. Um, but as I've gotten, the more horse I've gotten involved in, it is something that's on my mind because I don't, I don't want the horse to um, suffer after I'm not paying his bills anymore. And the bills can be can be expensive, so two grand a month. And um, the last horse that I had was Georgie Shore, and uh, Gavin Cromwell, the trainer, told me about Susie Barkley rehome and race horses. I knew Susie just from her training um, regime as well, and Susie rehomed Georgie uh, with an owner in England, and she absolutely loves him and. Um, that that was that was a really heartwarming story. Susie will actually pay you if the horse is suitable, and she'll do a lot of due diligence on the owners on both sides to see if the horse is a good fit. And you'll often find these horses will end up in Britain, where I think they've a I think sometimes they have a different attitude to horses. They 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 look at them m- maybe more as pets kind of than we do here. Maybe it's a bit more hard nosed over here. But Georgie ended up in England. But what was a completely mad story was um, I was involved in a horse called Barrio back in two thousand and nine. Um, and he was well out of sight, out of mind. He ran in a, I think he ran in like a claimer in Sedgefield. And Gordon Elliott, fair play to him, Gordon Elliott got him moved on. And I think Gordon got him sold at the racetrack that day. And as much as we didn't know who Gordon was selling the horse to, and I be honest, I didn't really care the horse that cost us so much money at that stage. We got an email uh, about a month or two ago from a woman in, in Durham who owns Barrio now, absolutely loves him. He's a new life. Um, I think he's like a, a ride horse at home. And what's this, 13 years later, Barrio, the horse we totally forgotten about, is still there and uh, has an owner who loves him. There's But there's a, there's a lot of questions. I mean, if you look at the horse in, in training, Vinny, it's um, 8,342 total horse in training, the latest figures. The current horse in training, 5,185. So obviously horses aren't in training all the time. But as you say, if you're breeding 8,000 8, horses a year, Susie's responsible for give or take 200 horses in a year, I think, being rehoned. What happens to the rest of them? And the, the elephant in the room is that um, quite a lot of them are euthanized. And um, I think we have to have a debate in racing about that, um, a kind of a, a debate where we we acknowledge that this is happening. It is an elephant in the room, but some, some horses at the end of their life... Um, Maybe it it is the, the 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 pragmatic thing for them to be done as long as they're well looked after in life. I don't necessarily have a big problem with the horse being euthanized if 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 it's too much worth at at that stage. But I think we need to talk about it more in race, and I think uh, in general people are kind of ignorant of it. And because of the animal welfare lobby, particularly in Britain, this is something we do need to get right. I think. I I agree. I I think this is a whole area that the industry needs to grab with both hands and sort out properly. Now, I'm not saying they're not doing that, but they're maybe a little bit late to the party when you see that a lot of the organizations that are involved in this area have been very recently put together. Um, Even Susie Barkley is only at this a couple of years herself. I think that, you know, Mm. this is something that she was just training and and fell into this because of of a UK based um, charity as well that was doing the same work. So looking at it, Horse Race in Ireland, look, they, they are certainly doing what they should be doing i think they they already fund the irish horse welfare trust and um, they support that with funding each year the issue i have there somewhat is that the irish horse welfare trust their website doesn't work which is a bit of a pain considering that you you know this that's that's there's only two two different bodies that horse racing ireland promotes to be your your starting area here if you if you own a race horse and you want to rehome it and you want to do the best by it what do you do you go onto the horse race in ireland website which is the official website of the of the industry and you see the irish horse welfare trust and their website link doesn't work and the other one then is troella which they don't actually um financially support but they have helped them build their website and i must say the website is fantastic for troella i i can't believe how good it is everything you could possibly want to know or certainly i want to know about how how do i go about starting to rehome my racehorse or whatever else and it's all there all all the contact details for people explains the whole process and they're not for profit so that that's certainly a very good um organization they're only set up in 2020 emma any other organizations you think are worth noting here in this area 
Yeah, I think there's actually one more that the HRI promote, uh, from what I've seen anyway, it's the Irish Race Horse Retirement Fund. I was actually speaking to um, the director, Jenny Lynch, this morning, and she she sent me on an article which kind of explained what they did, and God, it was just brilliant. And I, to be honest, I hadn't heard too much about them before, but basically um, it was set up, I think, in 2019 in association with uh, Theresa Murphy, or Theresa Murphy, yeah, sorry, from Equiad, and the kind of the idea behind it was they felt that there was kind of a gap in the market for providing kind of information and training, not just for the horses, but for owners as well, which I thought was brilliant because, you know, like we mentioned earlier, a lot of owners coming into racing don't really know what to expect um, or what to do after the horses finish their career. So they provide training, training courses for the owners as well as the horses. They assist in the re rehabilitation and retraining. Um, it was very interesting that she said, I, I, one question that I had about um, the aftercare of racehorses was, you know, maybe not all horses are suitable for uh, retraining for ridden disciplines. Um, in my, like, you know, some, some of them can be quite difficult. So you think, you know, maybe what, what's the life like for the horses who can't be retrained? But it was interesting. She, she said that like there's 2,000 horses leaving training every year. And she felt that, nearly every single one of them was capable of being retrained in some type of discipline be it ridden or otherwise which was you know very encouraging to hear because the breed of the racehorse i think gets a lot of stigma around it of being difficult to manage of being this and being that but they're actually a very intelligent um athletic and quick learning animal and i think that's something that needs to be promoted more um around the retraining of racehorses because a lot of people don't want to buy an ex racehorse or, you know, are worried about buying a thoroughbred, even if they hadn't won, because they have this thing that you know, they're going to be mad and flighty. But to be honest, 90% of the time, like there's horses in the yard there that kids could ride. You know, I had, I remember having, I had a pony when I was about 14 or 15 and <laughs> there wasn't a horse in the yard that was harder to ride than horse. She was an awful old yoke. But <laughs> like, I think that's the thing about, that's one thing about racehorses. I think they need to promote um, their, like the madness that's associated with racehorses, the stigma of that needs to be wiped out because 90% of the time it's just not true at all. And um, we saw it with the horses up in the RDS last week, how quickly they can adapt to a new discipline, how quickly they can learn their athletic ability to just transform into a whole new discipline in such a short space of time. And that's something that the Irish Racehorse Retirement Fund and Troella are both trying to promote, which I think is brilliant, really. Yeah, and yeah, I, I, we, we don't, I think, thing. Finney, we don't really sell sell that enough. And I know it's very hard, but I think racing needs to bring kids to, to race in yards to, to show them horses at an early stage. Because I think if you if you get into horses at an early stage, a lot half of the people will just fall in love with them. And there was a great line from Churchill in the Racing Post today and Chris Cooksby's, there's, there's something about the outside of a horse that is good for the inside of a man. And very much the inside of a woman as well, because you'll you'll find like that. Um, these women who are involved in horses completely fall in love with them. And you talk to people, uh, in in racehorse yards, and I owned a horse called Sabras, who was a modest enough horse, but was often placed, and they absolutely loved him around the yard just because he was a bit of a character. And he was, I got him in a claimer, and then put him in a claimer, and he was sent to uh, another yard after. So another few couple of people I should have mentioned. I talked. To, I spoke to John Osborne and HRI, and he spoke about as Emma was saying there the the, the high profile horses in the R D S. He said horses for that type of discipline are actually very sought after, and they're not that easily found. And I also spoke to Robert Hall, obviously, who you remember from the RTE days. Robert was involved in this brilliant project in Castlery Prison, where um, a lot of the prisoners in Castlery uh, are from a travelling background, and they would have an affinity with horses. And to give them some sort of hope when they get out of out of prison because of their affinity with horses, this program was brought in that, that horses were brought into the prison, um, so that they could kind of help the horses in one level and help the prisoners to kind of, um, I suppose, get an education that might help them. Um, to get involved in racing or in a, in a yard afterwards and there are so many roles for horses out there and they're, in, they're incredible animals Emma will know better than me but really incredible animals and maybe the last thing I would say is could we have a system where if you go to the to these websites it'll tell you like that you know who owns the horse it's the last owner of the horse could we have a system where the owner is still responsible for the ownership of that horse and it's 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 written down on the list so if I if I um if I, a horse I'm involved in, say I'm involved in Craig's man at the moment, if he moves on for me, does that have to be registered? And if he's not in training, who's responsible for him? And maybe we could do things like that because I definitely think it's an area we could improve on. Yeah, yeah one thing I was system. actually... Yeah. 
Sorry. Go ahead, um, I was, it yeah. was actually very interesting. I was in um, the salon that I was getting my nails done and my beautician, she was like, she wouldn't be, into, she's not into horses or anything, but she said she just took her kids up to the national studs, you know, to see the horse. Well, she didn't like, she didn't know who any of the horses were. Like she just, she was just calling them ponies in the field. Like, so it was kind of interesting to hear like that, like, you know, you think a lot of the attraction to that would be seeing the stars like Frank, or not Frank, <laughs> Hurricane Fly yeah. and Faheen and all those lads. But, you know, she just went up there and was showing her kids ponies is what she was saying. There's ponies running around the field, which, you know, I thought was interesting. You know, is that something that could be done a bit further? Does it have to be just superstars in these kind of animal sanctuaries, I suppose? Um, like there's a donkey sanctuary out by me and loads of people flock to it every, every weekend to watch just the donkeys walking around the field. You know, could you set up something like that where retired racehorses can just chill out and get, you know, treats and snacks from kids in the field you now? I was talking to Caroline Doherty from Troella and she actually mentioned that there is facilities like that in Australia and she didn't think they were a great idea because, you know, I suppose they could become a dumping ground at the end of the day. People could be just dumping the horses there if they don't want to retrain them. And that is true as well. But you no, know, I just I just thought it was interesting um, when she was calling the, you know, the stairs of the past, the ponies around the field, you know, do, does it really matter to people visiting these things? What kind of horses they are at the end of the day? Well, here, here's another little thing, just a, a thought. I, th I think it'll be probably rubbish by the pair of you. But what I was thinking was, if you look at these racehorses and you, you talk about the ones that were in the RDS, all these Duvans and the rest of them that were uh, famous racehorses in their day, and now they're being re retrained to do a different discipline. Could some of these horses not, could we not put on a whole program of veteran races for horses um, where we, we get them to be in training within the whole system of the industry for maybe another two, three, four years of their life, which would reduce the amount of time they'd need to be rehomed for. Not all horses would be capable of it, but you can see there's a trainer called Val O'Brien who tends to have older horses than anyone else. He used to have a horse called Final Tub. I remember it was a 15-year-old when the stewards brought him in for Half improvement barrel in form well, one yeah. day in Turles. Yeah. <laughs> um, but like he, he tends to have horses mature a lot later with him, whatever the reason for it is. But even if we had you know, races for horses of 14 years of age or 15 years of age, they don't have to be over any jumps, just let them trot if need be. I don't really mind, but they wouldn't they add to the spectacle at a, at a festival like Listowel coming up now next month if there was one race for them, all these 15 or 16 year olds, maybe you can have one for 20 year olds, I don't know. But not necessarily something that, that most people would want to bet on, but it might be something that would be encourage people to keep horses in training and have them in the industry for a little bit longer. What would you think of that one, John? Yeah. Sorry. I guess you'd have to pay for them is the only thing and that's that might be the problem in that like how would you kind of uh, fund it I mean Val has had horses I, I'm not sure about horses that age I don't know like I, I think when horses like that age you think of the likes of Doran's Pride and horses that are that's you know when 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 they when something befalls them at, at a bad age is it bad for um kind of the, the, the public image I don't really know um so I don't know what you make of it Emma yeah, I mean, I think, like, to be honest, I think racing is quite restrictive on the age limits for horses. I mean, you look at other disciplines like show jumping. I mean, horses are competing well up into their late teens at a very, very high level. So I suppose race horses are starting very young. And I suppose, obviously, they lose a bit of their speed as age goes on. Like all of us, we saw Ronaldo at the weekend. He was getting skinned by, <laughs> by who are they playing, the defender. He caught him. So I think that proves that age just catches up with everyone. You lose a bit of speed. But... Like, to be honest, I think you see people calling for these older racehorses to be retired. I think probably Faheen was probably the best example of it, wasn't he? Everyone was calling Willie Mullins mad and saying he should have been retired. And yeah. he went on to have one of the most amazing seasons a, a, a novice chaser will probably ever have. It was just brilliant. So I think, no, I think if a horse is willing to keep going and they're enjoying it and they're physically well, I don't see any reason why they should have to retire at a certain age. Um, yeah, so like it's I don't think it's a bad idea. It's actually quite interesting because you'd see a lot of these horses um, popping up in point to points to kind of X grade one horses and some people don't like that now. I think if they're able for it, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. But I think a lot of people have been calling for, you know, you'd see the likes of Derek O'Connor or Jamie Codd riding the horse, the great one horses and open lightweights. But people wanted to see the seven pound claimer or the five pound claimers in the point to points, you know, the younger jockeys who maybe haven't ridden 10 winners, let's say, get the chance to ride these horses and it'd be a brilliant way to get jockeys a stepping stone and get them a few winners um maybe on, on horses they would never get the opportunity to ride 
if those kind of rules weren't in place. So yeah, I think it could be definitely something that could be used to help both the horses and maybe younger jockeys to bring them through. Definitely, yeah. A seniors tour. That's what it could be, like the golf. Yeah, you could do the same. And I, I'd like to say, from a commercial point of view, I'm not quite sure how you do it. It's not going to be a necessarily a betting thing. You wouldn't want to see, you know, some old boy going around the field being whipped in a race either when he's 17, 18, 19, but maybe he could trot around and have a bit of fun, have a day out. Just it's a it's a thought for the future. But anyway, look, we're going to talk about a few other things from the last week. Um, one of them that I wanted to mention first off is a horse called Pink Fire Lily, trained by John O'Neill and Claire. Um, it's a three-year-old filly that he sent over to run in a group three in Goodwood the other day, and there was only four runners. So this filly, which cost him a thousand, has barely beaten a horse in any of its races in Ireland, ends up being um, group placed, finishing fourth in a, in a group three and picked up 5,360 quid. What do you think, Johnny? Is that one of the training performances of the last week, at least? One of the best bits of placing, anyway. I think a lot of trainers can train horses. They're no good at placing them. And I think a lot of trainers can place horses, but they're no good at training them. And um, in fairness to John O'Neill, I don't know, would this um, finish an 18 length last of four in a, in a race as a horse who's run eight times but has never been placed? Just looking up the pedigree here by French Navy, no pedigree whatsoever. Does it make her any more valuable? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but it certainly um, adds a few quid into the pot. I, I, um, I, yeah, I, d I don't even know about horses that are, are so poor running in races like that. Sometimes I think you should should have a, a base level to be even able to get in because I think they're a complete waste of time. And but I don't know. It was uh, certainly um, opportunistic, if nothing else. Yeah. Then another thing we were going to look at is Paul Nichols. He's calling for a two month break in summer jumping. Emma, is that a good idea? Um, like I, I listened to his arguments, I suppose, like you couldn't obviously see where he's coming from in a way. A lot of the jumps racing in England is very uncompetitive, you know, small fields, but at the same time, a lot of the winter racing in England is very uncompetitive. You know, I think he was mentioning that, um, a horse he had was running against in two runner fields every now and again, but I mean, if you look in October, November, there's probably horses running in three or four runner fields. I think it's probably... I think they should probably look at the way Ireland does summer jumps racing because it seems to work so well here and I couldn't imagine a two 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 month break going down well in Ireland at all. Um firstly I think the jockeys would suffer massively at two months with no none of their main income would be a massive loss. Uh staff as well, I suppose, are these horses being left off for two months? Do owners pay for them to stay in training until the racing comes back? What are the staff gonna do if there's no horses in the yard to ride? Um, apart from that, I think summer racing adds an awful lot to racing in general. And um, look at the tracks like, well, in Ireland anyway, look at the tracks like Kilbegan, the Galway Festival, all these tracks attract massive crowds. There are some of the best atmospheres you'll ever get at a racetrack or these country tracks in the summer, um, which is an, which would be another massive loss if the two two month break was to be put in place. They'd lose an awful lot of their fixtures. Um, and then finally, I think just the need for a good ground for horses is going to be, obviously the things are changing at the moment, there's different ground being being produced at different times of the year, but uh, there is some horses who are genuinely, genuinely want good ground and maybe aren't at the level of competing on good ground at different times of the month, different times of the year, sorry. So the, you know, the, in general, the racing in the summer is of lesser quality and it gives you know smaller yards, smaller, ho smaller horses with lower profiles younger jockeys a chance to you know showcase what they can do and no i i, I wouldn't agree i wouldn't be with a two-month break at all to be honest <laughs> i can't see it ever coming in in ireland in in, yeah. in truth but I, it probably won't come in in the uk either because they've they've just recently announced the bha their new fixture list for 2020 2023 and they've got the exact same number of fixtures they had this year so even though everyone's calling for a big reduction in the overall amount of fixtures in the uk because the low number of runners and lots of races and all the other issues they have around prize money. Johnny, what do you think? Uh, it's obviously not going to come in here. We couldn't see it in Ireland, but um, ground during the summer, that's a bit of an issue anyway. It is. like, and I, I don't think racing is, is confronting kind of the reality of climate change enough in terms of what it means. And I think you need to get race course managers together and clerks of the course to talk about what a summer like that we've had in Britain does for racing, because like if you have near 40 degree heat in some of the south of England and you've you've basically a drought, like how can you how can you be trying to keep racetracks um, fit for racing? Not not to mind the uh, uh, jumpers, but on the flat as well. And with the with the population as it is, it's probably easier for Paul Nichols to say it, who's 
going to be able to survive without racing for two months in the summer um, than it is for your run of the mill trainer. I mean, British racing is beset with so many problems. I mean, you know, you saw the the, the reaction of Mark Johnson to the um, prize money uh, kind of ideas that they brought in. They're really kind of painting, repainting a car that has a cracked engine at this stage. It has so many problems. This isn't going to solve it. But at the same time, what's the point of summer jumps racing when we have summer ground now nearly like 10 months of the year? Um, so we, we don't really need summer racing anymore. And if it's going to involve an awful lot of water and when there's going to be, um, like water is going to become a, a resource that we're going to have to manage much, much, much more carefully. The clerks of the course, if they have to create a completely artificial surface in the summer for summer jumps racing because they have to water it so much, what's the point then? I mean, you, you can't, you can, as I said before the show, Vinny, you've good ground in Navin in November now regularly. So, like, summer horses can basically race um, for much of the year. It's getting a lot drier. It's getting far too hot in the summer for race courses to cater for summer jumps. Um, so, I don't think it's a bad idea in theory. I think British racing, it needs to, less is more anyway. And I think if they cut out summer jumps racing, it would help. They did a utterly absurd situation last week where there were three summer jumps meetings in the one day. Um, absolute madness. So, I, I think there's merit to it. But I think in terms of the change in ground at racetracks, we need to have more of a conversation about this when Galway has to water for four months before uh, the Galway festival now that's a sign because it never stopped raining when I was a kid in Galway and now they have to water four months in advance so this is something we do need to talk about I think yeah I'd agree it's a, it's a, it's a big issue going forward there's no question about it um, and then one last thing that just um, seems a bit bizarre is jockey Ross Coakley an Irish guy who rides in the UK now he rode a Group 3 winner in Germany over the weekend, and he picked up a 23-day ban for his use of the whip. It turns out you're allowed five strikes of the whip um, is the limit in France. He seemingly, now I haven't seen the race, but I've spoken to his father, who tells me that he hit the horse four times in the conventional manner, and then the, they, the stewards deemed that he'd hit the horse another five times while both his hands were still on the reins. While he was changing his hands, the horse's whip was flicking against the horse, and that counted as a strike. That seems a bit bizarre, Emma, does it? But, but that's the way things are going, I suppose, with, with whip rules in other countries. We have Sweden as well, where you're allowed to carry a whip but can't use it. So can you see that being something that'll... Well, I don't know where it is with Ross Coakley. He's obviously um, going to be sitting back doing nothing for the next 23 days, but it's, 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 it's not good in general, is it, to see those sort of rules yeah. coming in? Yeah, I mean, when you hear a 23-day ban, you kind of immediately think, like... The horse maybe should have been disqualified if it's if it's going to be that bad to get such a big ban. But I didn't actually see the race now, but it's it's an interesting one because I don't see how he could be striking a horse when his hands are on the reins, maybe accidentally pushing against him or whatever. I'd have to watch the video back now, but you know it seems a bit it seems a bit crazy, right? Doesn't it? He hit the horse four times. The limit was five. He's banned for twenty three days. It's kind of hard to wrap the head around when you hear it first. I saw, I did see a bit of controversy on Twitter about it now, but I must, I must, I must have a, give a watch back on it to, to see. But yeah, some of some of these whip rules, like they they enforce them really to the letter of the law. Uh, you know, if any kind of a slap on the horse, obviously was counted as a, as a strike on that one, which probably is a bit crazy. Um, so no, I I'm sure he'll appeal it, and hopefully it'll go well from now. Yeah, hopefully he will appeal and hopefully he'll be successful. Uh, he's doing great in the UK. He really is one of the, the rising stars over there at the moment. So it's great to see him riding a group winner in Germany as well. Well, look, thanks for joining us, guys. Interesting chat again, as usual. And we'll be back this time next week for another go with the Irish Angle on Jump To It. And thanks to you for watching. Bye for now.